Hey, how's it going everyone? This is I Am Error, and I want to provide some assistance to new game developers who are struggling to make a perfect jump within Unity because of the overwhelming amount of tutorials online on how to make a jump and all the different conflicting ways in which you go about it. So naturally, I decided to add to the confusion by uploading my own video on how to perform a perfect jump within Unity. Before we get started, I want to quickly go over the goals I hope to accomplish within this video, just to make sure I'm not wasting anybody's time on what this video will actually go over. We're going to come up with the modular universal system that'll determine whether or not the player is grounded. It'll also describe how we can perform multiple jumps in the air, how we can have the character jump higher if the jump button is held down as opposed to a quick tap, and finally, how we can make the jump feel more controlled and less floaty. Now, what I'm about to show you is a complete solution for all jumping mechanics. I've seen a lot of tutorials online that'll go ahead and split these different topics up into three or four videos. So to make sure I'm getting all the good information into one video, while still respecting your time and not making this video longer than it needs to be, I'm just going to go ahead and provide each script as its entire solution, rather than type it out in front of you like most tutorial videos do. So without any further delay, let's go ahead and get started. As you can see, I have a very simple scene that only contains the main camera, two platforms, and the player. The components found in each of these game objects are going to be the default main camera. The platform game objects are going to be very simple game objects as well. They're going to contain a sprite render component with an image of a square, as well as a box collider 2D component with the default settings for it. As far as the player goes, it actually contains the same information for both the sprite render and the box collider 2D. The player also contains a default rigid body 2D component, with the only change being to the constraints tab in which we freeze the Z rotation. And then we have three scripts on the player that I'll discuss this video that you can copy by either clicking on the link in the description that'll take you to my GitHub page or simply pausing the video as I describe what the scripts do and copying what you see on your screen. Let me go ahead and get started with the scripts by opening up the character script and describe what it's actually doing. What this script is going to do is contain different reference variables, and this character script will be inherited by the two other scripts located on the player. And the reason we're doing this is so we can have consistent references among all the other scripts that'll go ahead and control different parameters on the player. It'll also contain a couple bool variables that'll be able to consistently tell all the other scripts what state the character's in. And the jump script that I'll show you here in a little bit will be the one that'll actually manage these bools but we have them set within the character script so that all the other scripts that will inherit from the character script will all contain the same information. In order to consistently feed the data amongst all the other scripts that are going to inherit from the character script, we need to create a virtual method that will define all the variable references so that any script that inherits from the character script can also run that virtual method so that not only are these scripts sharing the same information, which of course makes the data consistent, but it'll also speed up writing out different scripts because we won't constantly have to redefine the same variable references over and over again. So that's why we run this method within the start method called initialization. And then right beneath the start method, we have a protected virtual void initialization method. And the other two scripts that are located on the player will go ahead and also run this virtual method to get the same reference variables that we already defined within this script. Beneath the initialization method, we have a bool method that will go ahead and check for collisions around the player. And how this method is going to work is any script that needs to check if the player is colliding with something in any direction, you can call this method and then feed it the direction that you want to check in, as well as how far away from the player you want to check to see if there's a collision, and what specific layer the player needs to be colliding with in order to perform additional logic. So how we're going to use this method within the jump script is the jump script is going to be constantly running a method called ground check, which will go ahead and run the collision check method found in this character script. And then when we run the collision check method within the jump script, we'll be checking in the downward direction in a distance very close to the player, but outside of the player collider, as well as checking to see what layer the player is colliding with in a downward direction to make sure that the layer matches one of our platform layers. For those of you who are new to game development, I understand the logic within this collision check method looks intimidating, but let me explain it in layman's terms so hopefully it'll make sense. It's first going to create an array of raycast hit 2Ds, and we name this array of raycast hits 2D hits, and then we plug this hits variable into a collider cast method, which if you're unfamiliar with the collider cast method, it's basically going to be the same thing as a raycast. Instead of sending out one or multiple rays, it sends out one single ray in the shape of whatever collider is currently on that game object. So for the instance on our player, this collider cast method is going to be in the shape of a box. It's going to check right beneath the player itself, and then it's going to check for a platform layer. It's going to assign the amount of raycast hits to a number, and if this number is greater than zero, it'll go ahead and return true at that point. But if that number is less than one, then it'll go ahead and return false at that point. 
So just to clarify, the jump script is going to run this collision check method, and the jump script will have variables for both distance and the layer it needs to check for. So if the jump script runs the collision check method and it returns true, at that point the jump script will go ahead and change the is grounded value in the character script to true, which of course will allow the player to perform the initial jump at that point. Next, let me quickly show you the horizontal movement script I have. It's going to be a very basic script that's just going to handle left and right movement, as well as make sure if a player jumps and hits a wall and moves towards that wall, it won't stick to the wall like Velcro. Most of you watching this probably have a more sophisticated horizontal movement script, but if not, this is what I use to make my character move left to right. The first thing you're going to need to be aware of is the horizontal movement script inherits from character, not mono behavior, so make sure you change that. And then it's going to have a public float value that's going to be speed that we set up in the inspector window. It's going to have another public float value, distance to collider. And what this is going to do is check to see if there's a wall in front of the player so that it can limit the rigid body's velocity value in the X direction and not cause the player to stick to a wall like Velcro when they jump into it and move towards that wall. We're also going to have a public layer mask variable that we'll name collision layer. And this will help identify what game objects have a layer that the player needs to restrict horizontal movement if they run into it. Finally, we have a private float variable named horizontal input that's basically only going to check to see if you're pressing left or right on your keyboard or joystick. And we set this horizontal input value in the update method. This horizontal input value is either going to be negative 1 or 1 if the player is moving left or right. And it's going to derive that value from the input detection. Above the input detection, we run the initialization method. And as I mentioned, the initialization method just goes ahead and sets up all the reference variables that we have set up in the character script. Underneath the update method, we run a fixed update method, and we're going to calculate the speed in the fixed update method as opposed to the update method, because if you're unaware, the update method doesn't perform proper physics calculations, and the fixed update method is the only method that you should ever run rigid body calculations within. Next, inside the fixed update method, we run a method called speed modifier, and the speed modifier method will go ahead and change the rigid body's velocity x value, depending on the criteria, and for this example, we want to go ahead and limit the horizontal movement speed if the player is moving towards and colliding with a platform or wall. So what the speed modifier method is doing is running a long if statement that checks if the rigid body's velocity value in the x is greater than zero, which would mean the player is moving in a rightward direction. Then we run the collision check method to verify what's right of the player. And of course, it'll also check to see if the player is moving to the left and running into something to the left. And if the player is running into one of the layers that we choose within the horizontal movement script, then at that point, it'll set the rigid body's velocity value in x to 0.01f. If you need more time to copy this script, go ahead and pause the video here. Now let's take a look at the jump script. And I'll go ahead and describe the script from top to bottom to make it easier. But the first thing we need to do is make sure that the jump script actually inherits from character and not mono behavior. Because again, we want to grab those references within the initialization method, and the only way we can do that is if the jump script actually inherits from character. Next, we have quite a few different public variables. And full disclosure, we can make these variables serialized field private variables if you want. The only reason these variables are public is so I can set them in the inspector window. So if you want the extra security of a private variable, you can absolutely make these serialized field private variables if you want. It's really up to you. The first variable max jumps is going to be the amount of jumps the player can perform. The next variable jump force is going to be how high the player initially jumps when the jump button is pressed. The next variable max button hold time is going to be how long you have to hold on the jump button to perform a full jump. The next variable after that, hold force, is going to be how much additional height you gain when you hold down the jump button. The next variable after that, distance to collider, is going to be how far outside of the player collider that we want to check for a collision. The next variable after this, max jump speed, is really going to be a limit value of how quickly the player can rise when jumping. And this value is going to intertwine with jump force and hold force to really make sure the curve of the jump is easier to control. Right under max jump speed, we have max fall speed. And just like max jump speed, this is going to be another limit value that'll stop the fall speed from accelerating anymore so that if the player is falling off a very tall ledge, they don't fall faster and faster as they keep falling. Underneath max fall speed, we have a variable called fall speed. And what fall speed is going to do is it'll actually crank up the gravity on the player rigid body component so that once the player reaches the maximum height of the jump, we can have a fall that's going to be more in tune with other video games that you might have played, because quite frankly, video games aren't fun to play that follow the standard laws of physics, and most video games will have the player start to fall drastically once they reach the maximum height of the jump, and have inconsistent gravity forces applied to the player that again don't follow the standard laws of physics in the physical world. Next, we have a gravity multiplier variable. The gravity multiplier variable is going to contain the value of how much we need to turn up the gravity when the player actually starts falling. Finally, we have our collision layer variable, which will contain all the different layers that'll turn the player into the grounded state if they're colliding with those layers beneath the player. 
Underneath the public variables, we have a few private variables. The first two private variables are going to be jump pressed and jump held. And the reason we have these variables is because the update method is really good at checking for input detection, but it's not very good at handling physics calculations. And I want to check for input through the update method and then feed the results of the input to the fixed update method, which as I already mentioned, the fixed update method is specifically designed to handle rigid body calculations. So both the jump pressed and jump held private bools are just going to check to see if those inputs are being held down or pressed. And then we have two private float variables as well as a private int variable. And all three of these private variables are just going to reset other variable values to their original value. Right underneath all the variables, we run the initialization method. And the initialization method is going to do two things at once. First, it's going to give the jump script all the reference variables that we already defined within the character script. And second, it's going to act as a start method for the jump script itself, so we can set up those initial values in those private variables. Right underneath the initialization method, we have an update method. And all the update method is doing is checking for input to see if the spacebar is being pressed or held down. And then depending on if it's being held down or pressed, it sets up the values in the corresponding variables appropriately. The update method is also going to run a method called check for jump. We're also going to run another method called ground check. Underneath the update method, we have the fixed update method, and all the fixed update method will do is run a method called is jumping. Underneath the fixed update method, we have the check for jump method. The first thing it's going to do is check to see if the jump button is being pressed. If the jump button is pressed, it'll then check to make sure that the character is grounded. If the character is not grounded, but the number of jumps left still equals the maximum number of jumps, then that means that the reason the character is not grounded isn't because they performed a jump, but because they fell off a ledge. And in almost every single game out there, regardless of how many air jumps you can perform, the initial jump almost always needs to be performed in a grounded state. So as you can see, we set the character.isJumping bool to false, as well as we go ahead and return out of the method here. Now if the character is grounded, then it'll go ahead and negate from number of jumps left, and basically make sure number of jumps left is greater than negative 1. What it then does is it'll go ahead and reset the gravity scale back to its original gravity, so that if the player is performing additional air jumps, it'll go ahead and give the additional air jumps the full jump value. We also reset the velocity in which the player rises at to zero, basically for the same exact reason we reset the gravity. We then reset the button hold time back to its original value, and then we finally set the character.isJumping bool to true. However, after we negate number of jumps left, if the value is less than zero, it won't perform the logic that will allow the player to jump and basically just finish up the method there. Let's scroll down to the isJumping method, and as you can see, the first thing the isJumping method does is check to see if character.isJumping is true. If it returns true, it goes ahead and performs the additional jump with the rb.addForce. And then, of course, we apply that force in an upward direction and multiply it by jump force. And then we run the additional air method right after that. The isJumping method is also going to limit the amount of speed that you can go up or down, and that's what this if statement and the following method are both doing. If we scroll down and take a look at the additional air method, this method of course is going to perform additional jumping calculations if the jump button is being held down, and if the jump button is being held down, it'll go ahead and negate the button hold time by time.delta time, and as long as button hold time is greater than zero, it'll go ahead and run the rb.addForce method in an upward direction times the hold force value, which of course is going to make the player jump higher. But if button hold time is less than or equal to zero, or if we're still not holding down the jump button after we perform the jump, then it'll set the is jumping bool in the character script to false, which will basically end the jump at that point. Right underneath the additional error method, we have the falling method. And what that's going to do is handle the logic to increase the gravity amount as the player starts to fall, as well as limit the amount of speed in which the player can fall at. So as you can see, the first thing the falling method does is check to see if character dot is jumping is false because that'll mean that the player shouldn't be rising up in the jump anymore. And within that same if statement, it's also checking the rigid body's y velocity value to see if it's less than the value of false speed. And if the rigid body's y value is in fact less than false speed, we then change the gravity scale on the rigid body to the new gravity multiplier variable we have set up in this script, which will cause the player to fall faster at the end of the jump. The if statement right beneath is just going to make sure that the rigid body's y velocity value isn't less than the max fall speed, and if it is less than the max fall speed, it'll go ahead and limit that value to the max fall speed. Finally, at the very bottom of this script, we have the ground check method, which will constantly be running the collision check method, and as you can see in the ground check method, when we run the collision check method, we feed it the parameter of a downward direction, we feed it the variable of distance to collider, as well as the collision layer layer mask. We also only run this method if the character.isJumping bool is set to false, and long story short, we do this so we can perform additional air jumps, while also making sure that the player can't perform an additional air jump if they didn't do the initial jump from a grounded state. If the collision check method returns true when it's run in the ground check method, then it'll go ahead and set the character back into the grounded state, as well as reset the number of jumps left, as well as the rigid body's gravity. 
and then of course if the collision check method returns false, then this method will make sure that the character dot is grounded bool is set to false. Now from here let's save our scripts and go back into Unity, and let's set up the variables on the jump script as well as the variable for the horizontal movement script. For this example I have max jump set to 2, I have jump force set to 25, I have the max button hold time set to 0.4, I have hold force set to 25, I have distance to collider set at 0.08, I have max jump speed set to 6, max fall speed set to negative 30, fall speed set to 3, gravity multiplier set to 4, and for the collision layer dropdown I made a new layer for the platforms, I named this layer platform of course, and then made sure both of the platform game objects had the layer set to platform. For my horizontal movement script I had speed set to 500, and I have the same values for distance to collider and collision layer on the horizontal movement script, so go ahead and plug in 0 .08 for distance to collider and platform for collision layer, and that's it if we hit play and test it out. If I tap the jump button it performs a very small jump, if I hold it down it performs a full jump, if I jump again while in air, it allows me to perform one additional jump. And if I get on top of this platform and then try to jump while I fall off of the platform without jumping first, it won't allow me to perform a jump. Finally, if I jump and move into this platform, the player falls as it should, rather than get stuck to the platform like Velcro. You can go ahead and tweak the variables we have set up in the inspector to perform a jump that you would want in your game. But with all these variables set up, you as a game designer can now create the jump that you've been looking for for your game. I hope this one video covers all the bases that are normally talked about in three or four different videos, and any suggestions that you might have to improve this jump, feel free to leave in the comments. And of course, if you found this video useful, please subscribe to the channel, as well as hit the like button, and of course consider turning on the notifications for my videos, as I will only upload top tier proven solutions within Unity. One last thing I want to mention, is I do have a series on Udemy that goes over everything on how to make a Metroidvania style game, and if you are using this tutorial to create a jump for a Metroidvania game you're making, consider purchasing my course on Udemy, visit my website in the description to receive a discount for the course, but that's enough self-promotion for this video. I definitely appreciate you watching this, and hope to see you on my next video. Again, this is I Am Error, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day.